Welcome to a three-part series, Immediate Full Arch Reconstruction with Guided Surgery and Prosthetics. It is being presented by Dr. Douglas Diddy, DMD, MD. Tonight is part two placement, and we will begin the webinar shortly. And with that, it is my pleasure to first call attention to Tremaine Watkins. He's on our panelists and will be assisting with some of the Q&A. He is our clinical director of guided surgery with implant solutions here at NDX. And now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Ali Wyrick. She's a director of sales implant solutions and guided surgery with NDX and sequence. Take it away, Holly. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, or good afternoon. I have the pleasure of introducing to you, Dr. Doug Diddy. He is uh, an oral surgeon practicing in Delaware, He's been named a top doctor in Delaware today each year since 2006. He focuses on TMJ, implants, orthognathic, and full mouth reconstruction. He has been utilizing our digital workflow uh, with NDX and Sequence for over five years and hundreds of arches. We are thrilled to have him present tonight and look forward to part two. It's all yours, Dr. Thay. All right. Well, thank you for that. And thank you for everyone for coming back again for part two. And uh, welcome to those that are new uh, that haven't been here before. So uh, again, my name is Douglas Diddy. Uh, I have three private practices in Delaware, and I also teach part-time at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I've been teaching there for 17 years, which is where I attended residency. And I am going to continue with this part two, which is a lot of doing. Today, we're gonna to discuss how to do impression, uh, how to do uh, the actual procedure, um, how to create the final device. And part one was about um, patient acceptance and workups and um, how to, uh, essentially uh, figure out what cases to do and which cases not to do. So let's start by discussing the final devices that you can make. Uh, these are the some of the final prosthetic options. And as I've said before, it's always good to find out what your final prosthetic will be uh, at the beginning of the case, as you're working up the case, you want to decide where you're heading. What will your final uh, prosthetic be? Uh, when you're working with a company such as in sequence, uh, they will actually ask you what type of device you're planning on making. And there are four basic types, I'm sure you can come up with some variations or combinations, but these are the four basic types of final prosthetics. Uh, here is the classic hybrid, uh, which is uh, a titanium bar with acrylic, uh, fused to acrylic. Uh, and this is the least expensive of all of the options. Um, it still has its place, and this is a good choice for someone who's maybe older and maybe doesn't have a uh, heavy bite uh, because these denture teeth can break, these acrylic teeth can break. Uh, but the good news is that it's less costly and it's also repairable. It's less abrasive to opposing teeth as well, uh, which is nice for, for some patients. Uh, you do need a large vertical space. So you need to make sure that you have reduced enough bone to be able to place a final hybrid device uh, with acrylic like this. Uh, you need a minimum of 15 minute, uh, millimeters vertical. Uh, here is a... Uh, zirconia device and this may be you know most of you are familiar with with this product um, this is all zirconia and i would say this is one of the more common types of final devices that i see the advantage is that this is very hard very difficult to break this is a great choice for 
heavy ruxers. And the disadvantage is that this is more costly than the, uh, than the acrylic and it's very difficult to make any repairs. Another option is the nano ceramic. And the, uh, the nano ceramic is another great choice. It's a very similar price to the uh, zirconia. Um, the nice thing about this is that it is possible uh, to make repairs. And um, you can make this all, you know, um, you can create this all metal free. Uh, you can combine this with this trilor understructure material, uh, which is a millable fiber reinforced resin material. And this is a newer product. And the final device is a copy mill, which is a type of device where you essentially create either a bar or you can use a newer material, pecton, and you have uh, essentially all uh, abutment, or they look like crown preps, and you make essentially crowns for every single one of these things, individual crowns. This is the higher cost, the highest cost of all the devices. Um, I don't see these made too often, but it's a great choice. If you have a crown that breaks or any tooth that's easily uh, repairable, you can just remove one and remake it. Uh, pecton is essentially a uh, dense um, polymer uh, similar to peak material. So now I want to go through the process of the surgery. And uh, surgery is uh, the surgery is uh, something that I do think even if you're not planning on doing these cases, you really need to see how they're done uh, because overall it will help you to understand uh, what what has happened. You won't just see a patient come into your office to restore and. Uh, look at this case and have no idea how we got there. It's very important to know how we got there. And that will ha also help you with restorations. Others of you may be interested in doing these types of surgeries, or maybe you already do these types of surgeries. So hopefully I can give some information uh, that everybody can use here today. Uh, some pro tips, uh, some things that are basic, and hopefully everybody can learn something. I will say that if you're planning on doing these cases, uh, I do think this is a little more of an advanced level uh, surgical procedure where you do need to have some experience, even though uh, using digital certainly makes this a lot, uh, you know, a lot simpler. I'm going to make it look extremely simple, but there are still a lot of things we need to tweak and change. You need experience with bone grafting, soft tissue management. And you receive this kit after you go through the entire planning. We discussed planning in the first lecture series. And this is the, the, uh, the surgical kit, uh, which contains, it looks intimidating, uh, but it really is fairly straightforward. Uh, it has a lot of parts and pieces, but the nice thing is that it's laid out very well with step one, step two, step three, and uh, you will have an entire sheet of steps to be able to do your procedure. These are just some of the main parts of, of the kit that you will use. I put together, and I think this is a very important slide, I put together uh, some materials that you will need that are not included in this tip, in, in, in the kit, sorry. Uh, and one of the items that you need are these anchor pins, uh, anchor pins to anchor your bone foundation guide to the bone. They're 1.5 millimeter anchor pins. 
and you can request them from in sequence, but you do have to request them. Uh, you need a fully guided implant kit and you need a pickup material. Uh, I highly recommend that you have extra parts on hand. And I specifically have a photograph of the low profile abutments uh, because you never know when you're going to change an implant. And I will be able to show you in, in this third lecture how you will be able to change, uh, change abutments. Um, you will be able to change implants and make some changes, but you do need to have extra parts on hand and whatever grafting materials you like to use. One of the first things that I do is I hang up some of the paperwork that comes along with the kit. And I hang some of the important items such as the step-by-step -step guide to uh, what, you know, uh, the, the surgery itself. So this is step one through 10. There are 10 basic steps to go through when we're doing uh, a, a fully guided uh, digital type of immediate load hybrid prosthesis. Um, again, my preferred lab is in sequence for this. Uh, you will see some of the amazing features that they, that they have and provide. And we're on to step one. And the very beginning, the first thing that we do is we have this start bite. And the start bite essentially is a representation of making sure that the impressions were done correctly. And it also helps to um, show that the, uh, you know, the, the entire case was designed to this. So when you put in the start bite, if they bite right into it, you can feel fairly comfortable that your entire case will go as planned. A pro tip and something I've been doing lately is I bring my patients in approximately one week prior to the surgery. And it gives me a chance to review with that patient again, all of the subtleties of what we're doing. It allows them to answer questions, but I also check the start bite at that visit. Uh, just in case there's a problem, uh, we can always you know, redo it and um, Patients seem to really like it. And it doesn't even take long, and we make it fairly casual, and um, they they seem to you know seems to really uh, help, especially on the day of the surgery when they come in already knowing exactly what we're doing. Because usually it's been several weeks or or even months since you've seen them. These workups do take uh, several weeks to do. They're very creative on their start bites. So they were even able to make a start bite for this patient. Step two, we are going to reflect a flap and we are going to remove the teeth. Uh, this is the part where you need to look at your paperwork very carefully because if we've created a tooth borne bone foundation guide, you have to be very careful not to remove the teeth that you need to use to be able to see this guide. Uh, this is also the part where you need to have a lot of skills in atraumatic extractions, because if you lose all of these buckle plates, the entire case is done and you need to graft and come back and do this another day. Uh, I like to identify the nasal palatine nerve as well. Uh, this slide also shows you there's a palatal suture. Uh, I like to place a suture right in the uh, palate and it holds the palatal flaps out of your way. So you're more likely to have your guide uh, seated all the way. Step three um, is actually seating the bone foundation guide. Uh, it's very critical that this bone foundation guide is seated correctly. So I take, and I recommend that you take a lot of time to make sure that this is seated properly. It will take several minutes 
And there are several reference points that you will use to make sure that this bone foundation guide is seated correctly. The metal part, I consider the bone foundation guide and the plastic part we call a mono strut. This entire thing is connected with these little silver pins and uh, we're going to really make sure that this is seated correctly because every small error is additive and accumulates. So by the end of the procedure, uh, you will you may see large differences or discrepancies in the occlusion that you want and have to do a lot more adjustments if any of these steps are off. So step three, uh, we, we really want to pay attention to all the reference points. Uh, one reference point, let me go back for a second, is teeth. If you have a tooth borne uh, guide, then you need to look at these windows to make sure that these teeth are fully seated in these tooth windows. We will also look at the metal to make sure it is well adapted. And this metal is one thing I really like about uh, using in sequence uh, because it is just an extra nice touch and it's so accurate and the plastic tends to, uh, of bone foundation guides, tends to flex more, but this metal is just made and adapted so well to this bone. Uh, the third reference point are these little struts on this mono strut uh, device. So you want to make sure, and you can use an explorer to run it along underneath these uh, pieces of plastic to make sure it is fully seated on bone. This is another type of uh, bone foundation guide where we are, um, this is a bone foundation, a bone board born uh, bone foundation guide uh, where we are not using teeth, but a lot of times uh, what we will use are the opposing teeth. And so we'll use the opposing teeth to be able to seat. And so that will be one of your reference points. And I, included this because the final reference point, which is also extremely important, is to look at the posterior part of this bone foundation guide and make sure it's seated all the way. As you can see in this photo, there's a small piece of tissue underneath this metal. And if this happens, it needs to be pulled out and this entire thing needs to be reseated properly. So if you have any trouble, sometimes you can take the mono strut off of the bone foundation guide and just test that alone. And here we are using Explore just to make sure everything's seated nicely. And this is a case where we are making sure everything's seated perfectly and we are now placing the anchor pins, the 1.5 millimeter anchor pins. The anchor pins here are the silver, these big silver pins, and you will need to instruct your assistants to never pull these pins out during the case uh, because these pins will stay in for the rest of the procedure. The next step is to take off of the mono strut. So, as you can see in the photograph on the right, the mono strut is removed. And at that point, you can remove the remaining teeth. And I inspect to make sure it looks like it's seated properly. And we will now move on to step four. Uh, step four is bone reduction. The bone reduction uh, phase is in my opinion, one of the major advantages of using a digital lab such as in sequence. And I can't stress enough how important this is. And in my opinion, the key uh, to success in many cases, because by removing a calculated amount of bone, we now have our final device, the proper thickness. Uh, to be able to withstand uh, the chewing forces and, and, and not fracture. So 
we, we really want to make sure that this is calculated very carefully and we have removed the, uh, the bone and allowed the transition line of the prosthetics to be above the smile line. Uh, this has been very difficult, a lot more difficult to use uh, when I've worked with uh, conventional labs. It certainly can be done, but it is uh, uh, there's a lot more work on the part of the clinician to really figure out the proper amount of bone reduction. You can use a ronchure. You can use a reciprocating, reciprocating saw. Uh, you can use a large burr. I tend to uh, do this several ways. Sometimes I use a fissure burn, cut across uh, if there's a large amount of bone and use chisels and I use rongeurs and I use uh, these large uh, burrs to flatten out the bone. Uh, very important, the photo on the right, you need to make absolute sure that this bone is completely flat. There can't be any parts that uh, stick up in the air, uh, stick up above the bone foundation guide. And a very important uh, area to check is the posterior part of the bone foundation guide to make sure that all of the bone is removed back there. That's that's one of my pro tips that is uh, often the source of, uh, of the, uh, the next several steps or guides not fitting properly. So make sure that this bone is really leveled out. And a good way to check the fit is to actually take your, this is called your abutment guide, and seat this down on the bone foundation guide. And if it goes down and there's no gap between the abutment guide and the bone foundation guide, you know you've removed the, enough bone properly. So step five is the implant phase. And again, this has to be fully guided. Uh, these surgical guides are beautiful because they have irrigation windows and um, they have everything labeled. You can see the numbers of the implants that will correspond to your uh, surgical guide reference sheet. And at this point you place your favorite implants. Uh, one of the important things you need to look for here is what we call tining. These mounts, these silver mounts, go on the implants, and there are little notches, and you probably have seen this with other, if you've ever done guided surgery, uh, the notches will have to line up with the ring. And really, that only applies for any abutment that will be an angled abutment. Uh, the straight abutments don't matter as much, but you do need to make sure these uh, the tining is correct. And here are all of the implants placed. In this case, we did five. You can see some buccal gaps where we will most likely graft at the end. Uh, step six is your abutment guide. This is when we are going to place the low profile abutments. All of these abutments are, are, will already be in your kit labeled and you will know exactly which abutment will fit on which implant. Turn it a bit. Okay, I want to see the angle, go ahead. So here we are placing the abutments and I want to point out that uh, the, the line, the blue line is actually the screw uh, the screw access hole. So when the uh, the abutment is seated properly, your screwdriver will line up with that blue line, and you can use this uh, torque uh, wrench to be able to seat these abutments. You need to check with your implant manufacturer as to how high to torque uh, the abutments for their particular implants. Uh, as I've said in the first lecture, I've used uh, five different implant systems to uh, do these cases. I've been able to work with in sequence for all five cases. So 
uh, check with your implant companies and check within sequence, but uh, you are able to use a wide range of uh, dental implants for, uh, for these procedures. And now we torque down our abutments. Uh, if you want, you can try to take an x-ray. It's a little difficult at times to get x-rays, but I do feel it's very important to make sure these abutments are seated all the way. Uh, you can't have any gaps. Uh, you do need to profile the bone around the implants before you place any angled abutments and always inspect that bone very carefully before you place the angle abutments. Step seven, uh, we are going to pick up this device. So once the low profile abutments are on your implant, your implants are essentially finished. Low profile abutments, no matter what size of the implant, are always the same platform size. So the rest of the parts and pieces are uh, interchangeable, will fit, anything will fit on any of those implant low profile abutments. What we need to do is add copings that will now become incorporated into your long-term provisional. And one of the, um, we may have to adjust things a little bit if our implant was timed a little bit, if we were just a little bit off, uh, sometimes we need to open the holes. Um, I like to check uh, with with these little blue, uh, you know, with 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 some type of small pin that I put on top of the uh, low profile abutments uh, first before I put on the copings, and um, these are what my low profile abutments look like, and these little pins with the blue dots. I I uh, I made these myself just so I can see. Um, I could place these on the abutments and just to see uh, if they're coming out the center of those uh, those holes. Uh, here's a perfect situation where uh, this is this uh, pin on top of the low profile is impinging on the acrylic. So uh, the nice thing about having a chair side assist is that I can give this device to that person and they can start opening uh, these holes and the locations needed. And at the same time, I give them the second uh, provisional, which I, I will talk about shortly, um, and they can open up the holes on both of them. And once you uh, do that, I start placing the temporary copings. Again, another nice thing about using a digital lab is that these, these copings are already pre-cut and labeled with your uh, implant number. So you will know exactly which one goes on which implant. Um, the copings will be incorporated into that long-term provisional, uh, as I've said. And I advise you to place the copings on the uh, straight abutments first, typically, and then keep checking your long-term provisional to make sure it's fitting passively over these copings, and then do the angled, the angled abutments last. Uh, and then again, check to make sure you have a passive fit. Once your copings are on, you place this gasket on the center picture. And on the right, you uh, in, in sequence provides these green uh, plastic straws to block out the holes. And now we place our prosthetic. We secure the prosthetic to the bone foundation guide with these little metal pins. And now we can either check the bite. Uh, I like to check the bite and have them close. Uh, you can request what's called a prosthetic bite. So you can uh, have them bite into that prosthetic bite. Um, and 
the next step is to, to cure, to actually add your pickup material into these uh, holes. There are little holes on the side uh, and, and venting holes around every single coping. And you will first place uh, this pickup material into these holes. Uh, and it is a little bit of a, um, a feel. You need to put in enough to be able to loot the coping, but you don't need to overfill either. You can also fill from the top. After you do that, you remove your long-term provisional and you hand that to, in my case, I hand it to my chair side assist that I highly recommend. And they will start uh, cutting off all of the, all of the um, arms and developing this into the uh, final device. Uh, the, or the long-term provisional. Step eight, we're going to make a second long-term provisional. And this is extremely important and another advantage of using digital because we have a second device in case the first one breaks. <laughs> uh, but more importantly, I will show you in a little bit, this saves many steps uh, when we are creating our final. So these are several of the steps that it would take uh, when using a conventional approach. Uh, we will, you know, you will need to take impressions of the implants and then create an implant model, then create a wax rim, then uh, start to develop a bar. And finally you'll make the bar and then you'll have a wax up of the teeth and finally insert the, the final device. Uh, having that second long-term provisional will save you uh, several steps. Step nine, while uh, our chair side assist is creating the long-term provisional, I am starting to do bone grafting where it's needed and uh, filing. I like to file these sharp edges and I will start stitching. Stitching has to be resorbable in these cases because you are not going to be able to have access to remove these sutures. I also advise you to suture fairly loosely. This is not a very tight suture. It may look like a tight suture, um, but in, in this case, in most cases, I have one stitch in between every implant, uh, sometimes two sutures. Uh, you may also notice there are these little silver domes. These are not the low profile abutments. Uh, these are actually healing domes and every implant company should have something like this that you can put on your, your implants uh, so that you can suture around these healing domes. Uh, because when we remove them at the end, the tissue collapses fairly quickly and I want to be able to put that device in immediately. Finally, step 10. And step 10 is when we will uh, finalize this device. This is uh, essentially what is happening uh, in, the, in the lab. And we will deliver this interim uh, long-term provisional. I wanna point out the photograph on the bottom right. Uh, I think this is an extremely, extremely well done device. Uh, well-made uh, provisional. Uh, I don't think that most of us can do something this nice on our first try uh, for sure. And again, it's nice to have this uh, seasoned uh, lab chair side making this while we are uh, finishing doing our surgery. Uh, I do want to point out that our implants are subgingival. And so uh, you can see that the um, the acrylic is fairly narrow around uh, around these um, copings, uh, so that this device can be seated somewhat subgingival. Uh, the lab uh, chair side uh, person will first fill in the voids, 
and then begin to um, shape this device. Uh, the remove all the excess acrylic. Uh, stiff bristle brushes, rubber points are very helpful. I like to warn my patients that these acrylic long-term provisionals are usually bulkier than what their final will be, especially if they're using zirconia or nano ceramics, uh, so that they understand that it, it, you know what they're going to experience. And the polishing begins. And here's a final device, uh, or a long-term provisional device. We insert the device, and most of the time the occlusion is, is good, but keep in mind that there will be some adjustments that have to be made to this occlusion. And so you will now get your articulating paper, and I recommend that if you are the person doing the surgery uh, and not if you were uh, if you're doing this and you're not a restorative doctor that that you do the first round of occlusal adjustments try to get this as close as you can and then I like to have uh, our restorative doctors take a look at these patients uh, anywhere from one day to a you know three four days later and do another set or another round of occlusal adjustments. I like to also ask the lab to create zero degree teeth. Uh, we, we will discuss occlusion in just a minute. And this is fresh after inserting the device and a small amount of an open bite, and this will require some adjustment. And so this is an extremely boring slide, but uh, I, as an oral surgeon, I had to read a lot of very boring studies <laughs> on occlusion. So you're just going to have to deal with it. <laughs> um, so the occlusion, what I found is that there's, there's no consensus on what kind of occlusal scheme we want. Uh, you do want to provide maximum intercuspation uh, during clenching and reducing occlusal load. Uh, you want to have a good surface area. You don't want to have narrow teeth. Um, these are sort of the consensus of a lot of the studies that I've seen. Uh, no premature occlusal contacts or interferences. Uh, so have your patient do their uh, lateral motion and anterior motion um, excursions and adjust accordingly. Uh, we do not want to have a large cantilever on our long-term provisional. So if, if that is the case, I would recommend cutting off the posterior part. Um, and we want these patients in group function as much as possible. And um, moving on. So after the device is adjusted and inserted, uh, we can block out these holes with PVS. Usually PVS is a short-term material. Uh, when they go to the restorative dock, sometimes they will then take this out and uh, pack some Teflon tape and composite. And here is a sample case that I think went beautifully. Um, this is the occlusion that I got with no adjustments, again, using a digital approach. And I wanna point out again, that transition line is always hidden above the smile. Another case, same thing. This is prior to any adjustments. So there is still some adjustments to be made. And I don't know what happened there. Moving on. 
another case and uh you know the transition line is hidden above his smile line so the final prosthesis this is the last uh part of this discussion uh, many of you may be more interested in how you get to the uh, the, the final, how you create the final prosthesis. Uh, this can be two visits using this second long-term provisional uh, where you can have one visit to take impressions and do all the um, uh, occlusal adjustments, things you, uh, changes you want to make, and you can go right to final uh, I suppose if that long-term provisional is exactly what you want, then uh, you can go directly to final. Uh, I would suggest to you all to uh, create a wax up and have uh, three visits. Um, I also suggest that patients keep a list of likes and dislikes, things that they um, uh, would like to change. Uh, things such as color would be very easy to change. If the midlines are a little off and the patient notices that and, and would like that change, there, you can change just about anything. If you're going to make a lot of changes, uh, make sure you take your impressions and mount it on an articulator. Uh, even for double arches, you may want to use and mount everything on an articulator at the end. Uh, here's a case that uh, we finished recently where this person needed a bar overdenture uh, to provide better lip support, uh, which we discussed at the, the first uh, lecture. And don't forget to tell your patients that they need to eat soft foods for the entire duration of the long-term provisional. An easy, uh easy way to explain this to your patients is to say uh eat any food that is not crunchy or any food that you can cut with a fork they do need to stick with foods like that they can eat seafood and fish and ground meat consistency they should eat raw vegetable i mean sorry cooked vegetables not raw vegetables but they do need to stick with this, even though they will have no pain. So I try to reinforce that at every visit. Uh, the duplicate long-term provisional eliminates a lot of steps. Uh, this is basically a triple jig. It already will fit onto your implants and you will be able to save a lot of steps here. Uh, let's talk about the first restorative appointment. This will be the longest appointment. You adjust the occlusion as necessary and mark any changes you may want to make, especially if you need to move the midline and you record a bite registration. You could even uh, put, yeah, ba basically a bite registration is, is the main thing you need. You will remove the long-term provisional, and hopefully your tissues look good like this. And you will take an impression, or I recommend a digital scan uh, of the uh, upper and lower. And this patient is a good example because some changes do have to be made with the occlusion. And you will take your, well, the first of all, this is the long-term provisional, uh, sorry, the, uh, the, the second provisional, not the first provisional. So the first provisional, the occlusion was adjusting, was a, you know, a lot better. And then this second one, this is the backup. Uh, you're going to have to make some adjustments again to this. And you take uh, acrylic material off of the uh, off of the bottom of this device to make room to be able to place your impression material underneath to account for all of the tissue changes that were made during the healing phase. And now you use 
PVS, light or medium body, and place this underneath the gaps you made. If there is enough um, recession and remodeling, you may not even have to adjust the device if you have room to place this material underneath. But you want to recapture again the, the uh, fully healed tissues underneath. And you do this from both the buckle and the lingual. Uh, here is your, your impressions, and here is your fun. So this is a full zirconia, upper and lower. And smile. And this is a young lady who has upper, the upper um, uh, is still, is wax. A little pro tip, please tell your patients not to bite down very hard on the wax because they can break everything. And then this is her fun and her smile. Another patient here. So, and that's it. So thank you very much.